صورت در این سری که حالا فکر میکنم این حداقل یه پارتش باشه قراره که یک سری مسائلی رو باز بکنه در رابطه با باز به خاطر عدم دونستن لغت مناسبی براش میگیم تکامل ذهنیات انسان تکامل فرایند شناختی انسان که این همطور که ارز کنم قسمت اولشه من برای اینکه زیاد این منومه نکنم و این نخوام خیلی از نکات رو برگردنم به فارسی از اول تصمیم گرفتم که این, این سری رو به انگلیسی برگذار بکنیم و شاید اینجوری یه زرم تماشا شدم آدینس همونم از یک باشگی فارسی زمان شاید در بیاد برشورم میریم سر اصل مطلب so, uh, nobody is here who is English speaking only اینو میگم که این کسی هست اولش رو شاید نخواهیم میده باشه uh, so the, the, the topic as I said is uh, uh, really actually borrowed from, from a, a documentary series that was aired on National Geographic uh, entitled The Human Ape. And I added the rest of it myself because I, I, I thought it would require a little bit of elaboration as to what we're talking about. So um, this documentary aired a couple of years ago and it really attracted a lot of attention both from the uh, non-scientific community and, and from the scientific community. What I want to clarify before we get into the depths of, of, of this discussion is that I'm not here to make any statements about um, you know, the, the possible implications of, 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 of uh, the topic of evolution beyond the scientific, beyond a scientific discussion. So uh, what we're talking about is a, a very well-established scientific framework that has been able to, uh, to explain many, many, many phenomena relating to the uh, diversity of, of life forms on this planet um, and uh, as a result uh, psychologists and, and philosophers in the past few decades have started tapping into that framework as a way of explaining how the mind particularly that of the uh, our species may have also undergone some some changes some uh, some modifications some uh, adaptations to reach its current state, which we consider as sort of an end state of our evolution uh, to this point. So what I'd like to start talking about, uh, well, at least uh, uh, before I get to the, the, the meat of it, is a little bit of an overview of what you should expect for tonight's presentation. Uh, so I'll start by giving you a description of what cognitive evolution is all about. Uh, this will get into, I want to forewarn you, <laughs> this will get into a little bit of technical uh, technicalities and uh, I, I want to apologize ahead of time if I start losing some of you, so please don't hesitate to stop me at any, any time you feel like, or any time you feel you're, you're falling off the wagon or so, or so to speak, and, and uh, we can even enter a discussion right at that point and we just carry along until uh, we get out of this mess <laughs> and start uh, really uh, uh, maybe getting to the, the, the <coughs> main attraction, which is uh, the uh, couple of uh, segments of the documentary that I picked for, for tonight's presentation, uh, which starts by defining the, the place of uh, humans as a species in the tree of life, if you will, in, in the evolutionary ladder, and as a result, it gives you an idea, gives us an idea of how humans are related to other species that currently exist, and how they, they, they may share some, some, some characteristics, some capacities, and so on and so forth with those species. And then uh, we start uh, talking about how, how one can systematically delve into this question of what is 
uniquely a human characteristic or capacity and what is not, what is shared with other species. And, and if we can do this uh, systematically, and I, and I don't claim that this documentary is a very exhaustive way of doing this, but it gives you a sense of what, what kinds of things can be done and are being done at this point in time to answer these questions. So if we can get a handle on, on how, to, how to study this problem, then, uh, at least in my humble opinion, we, we, we have a better definition for who we are as, a, as an organism and how we've got to this point in time and space as far as our minds and, and, and the development of our minds is concerned. So, um, I want to start by giving you a, a little bit of, a, of, of perhaps a refresher on what uh, the evolutionary theory is, is all about. Because if we don't understand that, then nothing really will make sense from, that, from, from this point onward. So, in a nutshell, and I, I, again, I apologize if I oversimplify things, but uh, given the diverse diversity of the audience, I have to do my best <laughs> to, to, uh, to be understood by everybody. So, uh, the idea behind the evolutionary theory, as proposed by Darwin, and uh, as, as, uh, as it's undergone its own, if you will, its own evolution uh, throughout the, the last 150 years or so, is that uh, things uh, characteristics, uh, features, uh, uh, whether uh, they be anatomical or physiological, they don't just happen out of thin air. They don't occur uh, by some random, uh, sorry, by some, some uh, uh, strike of a magic wand and then poof, there is, a, there is an ant and poof, there is a mouse and then there is, a, there is an ape and then there is a human being. But that life has undergone several hundreds of millions of years of, of, if you will, just change and, and adaptation and so on and so forth to reach its current state, to have to a point where we have over 10 million different species of, of animals and plants and different life forms on this planet. And that, uh, uh, that uh, each one of these is the result of that uh, history. Of, 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 uh, of evolution. Now, how evolution works based on, uh, again, the current uh, updated uh, theory, which was based on the original uh, suggestions of, of Charles Darwin, is that the, there are some random spontaneous processes that go on in nature that bring about change in the blueprint of life. Um, and the blueprint of life, we're talking about the DNA that codes for every uh, single characteristic that is uh, manifested in, 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 in an organism's physiology and, and anatomy. So these changes happen uh, according to, uh, to, again, the modern theory, because Darwin wasn't aware of, of anything resembling a, you know, a genetic code or anything of that sort. But essentially, uh, the DNA is where these changes take place. Uh, it's either through the, uh, the copying process that changes, spontaneous changes happen, uh, things are added, things are, information is added or removed, or is, is, is changed in some, some uh, fundamental way that leads ultimately to a change in the, uh, in the characteristic of the individual. So the way to think about it, to, to try to, to imagine it, is to take a look at your own hand. How did this feature, this, this uh, part of my body, come to be? And uh, it, it could be that uh, in, in the development or evolution of uh, vertebrate uh, animals, uh, such things as limbs started to develop and, and became uh, adaptive advantages for those creatures to be able to move around, to grab things, or propel themselves better in, in water or on, 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 on land and, and so on and so forth. And over time, those changes became more and more pronounced to the point that we have, for example, a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, limbs that all share some, some essential features. There is a, uh, if you will, an, an arm component. Uh, where is my pointer? 
there's a forearm component, there's a wrist, and then the digits that uh, extend from the wrist. And, and in some cases, they take on very uh, uh, strange shapes and forms. In the case of a bat, for example, the wrist is very, very miniaturized, but the fingers, if you will, but the digits are very expanded to allow <coughs> for, the, for the web structure of the, of the bat's wings to, to form and for it to be able to fly. In the case of uh, the human uh, arm uh, or, or forearm, you have uh, uh, more, I guess, proportionate distribution of these uh, of these features. So, the the question that you might ask is why would uh, a simple idea as uh, such as that of a limb undergo so many changes? And that's sort of the other component of the evolutionary theory that these changes become selected for because they confer upon the individual that has them, that, that has inherited them somehow, uh, an advantage over other members of their own species. So these random changes that occur, they don't happen in everybody. Some, some creatures end up having, let's say, uh, if they're tree-dwelling mammals that uh, are hanging upside down, let's say if, uh, an ancestor of a rat, some of them will end up having genetic changes that uh, would allow for these digits to grow larger and larger, or longer and longer, and that gives them the advantage to start maybe uh, gliding uh, over some distance or uh, ultimately flying, and that gives them better access to food, and that gives them better chances of survival, and ultimately better chances of passing on those specific traits that now they have acquired to the next generation. And if enough time passes, then you start having uh, two groups of bats, a group with these kinds of uh, uh, limbs and a group with shorter limbs, and perhaps uh, environmental pressure, scarcity of food, or predators that would come and eat these creatures would give the ones that can fly away faster or fly away farther to get food, the advantage of survival. And ultimately, the group that can't fly farther ends up getting decimated by predators or they die off because they can't find food as fast as the other ones. And, and what remains is a pure population of these bats that have the, the long digits and the web uh, fingers, if you will, and the ones that can fly. So this is the process through which these slight changes over the scale of evolutionary time end up leading to, uh, if you will, diversification of species or speciation as, as uh, evolutionary biologists uh, call it. So uh, the same thing, uh, if, well, if the, the arm is a feature of our anatomy, uh, the brain is a, also a feature of our anatomy and physiology, it's an organ that is doing a lot of, other, a lot of very interesting things. And we can see that the brain itself has undergone quite a bit of uh, change. Uh, and again, this is not an evolutionary timeline, but you can see a variety of brains uh, in various uh, creatures. All animals have, have some kind of a central nervous system that requires the collection of these uh, uh, mass of neurons in a, in a part of the body that's very well protected in the skull. And you can see that these brains come in different sizes and, and shapes and so on, and the humans seem to possess the largest, not in, in terms of absolute size, but the largest ratio of brain to body size uh, uh, of all creatures. So there has been sort of a push towards, in, in evolutionary history, for the brain to get as large as possible without getting the, the individual into uh, into the species into problems during birth because in the large, you know, the, the larger the head or the brain gets, the larger the head gets, and then the, there's a problem that it has to go through the birth canal, and then possibly that uh, has been some limiting factor as to how large the brain can get uh, before it's born. But anyhow, that's a separate issue. Uh, if you want to look at it in more uh, uh, linear uh, sort of scale in terms of evolutionary timeline, we can see that the skull and the brain uh, together have undergone quite a bit of change, both in size and in terms of their relative complexity from our very old ancestors 
uh, monkeys or ancestor of the of the, of, of the primates all the way to the modern human, um, Homo sapiens sapiens. All right, so. Um, so this is sort of, a nut, in a nutshell, what evolution and the evolutionary process uh, do in order to, um, well, I mean, they, they don't really have a purpose, they just happen to be, and, and, and we seem to define purposes for them because of the way we look at things and because of the, the, the utility that we find for these changes and these features that emerge out of, out of these processes. But essentially, uh, the idea is that as a result of these benign, completely random changes, again, based on uh, uh, the current evolutionary theory, you know, some of you may or may not agree with the benignness or lack of purpose of that, uh, but based on this theory, because of these changes, we have this diversity of, of creatures on this planet, at, at least morphologically speaking. You look around, you see, I don't know, five different types of, um, um, of, uh, of cows or uh, three different types of cats or you know 500 different types of, uh, of, of, uh, of fruit flies and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, <coughs> the idea behind what we're going to talk about tonight is what happens to uh, what the brain seems to be doing. So if the brain itself, uh, as an organ, as a, as, a, uh, as a part of our anatomy and, and physiology, has undergone these massive changes, and it's sort of uh, been considered as the hardware, if you will, for the mind to operate in or on, then what happens to the software that the brain is carrying? What, what kinds of things have changed? Well, how many kinds of revisions, if you will, have have have, have, have been implemented in this software since it was first, since it first came to be in a, in a very rudimentary, simple brain of, of, let's say, a frog or a fish. But we don't want to go that far back because then we would end up having a hundred part series. Uh, and I, I, don't have, uh, I don't have any intentions of, of giving that, that many talks. Uh, so we're going to... Uh, narrow the discussion to, uh, to the immediate sort of vicinity of our evolutionary history and take a look at what kinds of things have happened since human beings have evolved from some common ancestor to these great apes. If we can get a sense of what kinds of things have changed uh, since uh, we've started uh, splitting ways from these uh, from these apes, we have a better understanding again of what is uniquely human, what is a human characteristic, and what is not, what is shared with other species. And again, from from both a scientific uh, perspective and even from a non-scientific perspective, I think it gives you gives gives one a very realistic view of our place in the context of all life forms and in the context of nature. So uh, that brings us to uh, the real first topic, which is uh, what cognitive evolution is all about. So here is where I'm going to get into a little bit more uh, technicalities. I'll, 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 I'll try to start easy <laughs> and uh, you can stop me whenever you feel like. So the idea behind cognitive evolution uh, is uh, simply that it's an extension of what we've talked about so far. If the brain as an organ has undergone these changes, if the limb as a, as, a, as, a, as a part of the body has undergone these changes, if the digestive system has undergone changes, to better adapt to the current situations of, of an organism, to its niche, so it can help the organism, if you will, survive longer and then ultimately be able to pass those traits on to the next generation, you could say that the same thing must have happened to the mind. But in order for that to happen, we have to define the mind uh, in, in, in a framework that resembles the physiology and the anatomy to some extent. So 
the current thinking about how the mind operates is that it's a bunch of modules. A collection of modules, <coughs> each having a very specific function. These work together in a very synergistic way to allow us to do everything that you and I are doing right now. To be able to produce speech, to be able to comprehend, hopefully, <laughs> what, what is being said. Uh, to uh, process visually what's being shown in terms of <laughs> spatial location and color and depth and so on and so forth. Uh, to be able to recognize somebody's face and somebody's voice, to be able to tell them apart from people you don't know, and uh, to have a memory to carry all this information forward in time or to access information, uh, particularly for the, for the cases of, of uh, recognition. Uh, to sort of pull out a template and try to match what you're seeing or hearing to what you've seen or heard before to make recognition occur, and so on and so forth. I mean, the list goes on and on. But the idea is that each one of these um, capacities is a very distinct, very circumscribable domain of the totality of, of human mind. <coughs> and uh, in some ways, in some cases, there are there's overlap between or amongst these capacities in, in the sense that they share certain kinds of processes or they, they, they access the same kind of information, but they do different things with them. And in some other cases, they could be completely uh, mutually sort of exclusive of one another. They, in, the, in the case of, let's say, voice recognition versus face recognition, they require two different sets of inputs, completely different environmental energies, different brain areas are involved, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the interesting thing is that in the past, again, century, I would say, uh, there's been a lot of em effort to try to localize uh, these specific functions to different brain areas. And you know, some part of what I do as a, as a, as a scientist, uh, and, and what most people do, uh, what most people do in, in cognitive neuroscience, uh, in uh, behavioral neuroscience and all sorts of uh, neuroscience fields, right? So we're trying to sort of uh, get a sense of what each part of the brain is doing uh, and what uh, those, uh, how those capacities are linked with uh, different brain areas. But again, that's that's a different topic that we could spend another session uh, or two talking about. Uh, but the idea uh, that extends from this is that. Uh, again, if we want to tie all of these back to those evolutionary ideas, uh, the extension of this idea is that the, the function of each of these modules in that evolutionary framework is thought to be the result of these processes that have, that have led to the, if you will, the betterment of the species. A, 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 a species uh, uh, an organism that can uh, see color is far more superior in terms of vision to an organism to its um, cousins that can't see color. And I'll show you an example of that. So if that seeing of color, which is a mental capacity, is a, is, 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 a, is a result of an adaptation that has taken place in the context of genetics and you know, uh, passing down of, of a trade from one generation to the next and so on, then you can start with some caution generalizing from there and say maybe other capacities have also arisen <coughs> from such processes. Our ability to recognize faces may be the result of such an evolutionary process. Maybe some creatures can't, if they're lower down in the, in the evolutionary tree, maybe they can't process faces, and face processing or face recognition becomes important for certain creatures, and all of a sudden they have the capacity to, to make sense of what's, what information is contained in, in a, an individual's face, and so on and so forth. Again, um, uh, I'm not telling you the, again, the whole story because I, I don't want it to get out of hand and get too technical, but if you feel like you need more information or that I'm not being clear, please stop me and uh, we can discuss things as we go through. Excuse me, uh, what's the difference between brain and mind? 
Okay, the, the best way we could define that relationship, again, based on uh, the, the more or less the consensus in, in modern psychology, is that is the, the, same, the same difference, if, if you will, that a computer hardware has with a computer software. That the mind is the software. You can't pinpoint it, you can't look at it, you can't put your finger on it, but it requires some kind of machinery to operate on or within. And uh, that's how they're entangled with one another. A, a brain that's alive necessarily and inevitably leads to mental capacities. Uh, and a brain that's mm, that's alive and intact, of course, to, to a normal sort of mental capacity. And a brain that is partially uh, intact or has sustained some damage, we start seeing certain kinds of problems arising from certain kinds of damage. So we know that the, the specialization of, or the localization of function, is, to some extent, is a, is a valid sort of way of explaining things. Now, one of the best ways we can, uh, at least in my mind, we can talk about cognitive evolution is using Cecilia Hayes' framework uh, for uh, describing what we mean by cognitive evolution. Now, this is where things get a little bit uh, sketchy, and uh, please, again, don't, don't, don't hesitate to stop. So this theory, since it was published in 2003, has uh, garnered a lot of support uh, within the community, of course. And uh, I, I personally like it because it's uh, it has a very uh, systematic way of, of describing all that can happen to give rise to some sort of adaptation in the domain of, uh, of, of mental processes. But you could, one could easily generalize this framework to apply it to other forms of evolution, that of the physiology and of the anatomy as well. So based on her description, uh, there are two sources for evolutionary forces and there are two loci upon which they, uh, they act. So uh, the sources could be either natural selection or developmental selection. And the locus could be either the mechanism, the, the, the cognitive mechanism or process that is uh, undergoing some change, or the input to the cognitive process. And then there's a whole bunch of terminology that you get to put in the in the in this table, which will take us a few slides to to untangle and to understand. So, as a result of this, the crossing of these two levels with these two levels, you get four obviously four uh, possible outcomes, and those four possible outcomes are the four ways in which cognitive evolution could occur, according to to um, to Hayes. So um, I'm going to carry forward this table in a small form down there so we don't forget what's, what we're talking about. And <coughs> we'll go through these uh, uh, one step at a time. So the sources of change, as I said, are either gene-based, something happens to the DNA, to the genome, for example, in the case of color perception or color processing. Um, there is a specific <coughs> protein that is coded for by a very specific gene uh, on the X chromosome. Okay. Uh, it has been on the X chromosome for as, as far back as mice and other rodents have, have been living on this planet. At some point during the evolution, this gene has been duplicated and some change has happened to the structure of the gene. So now that sister gene sister of the original one, is coding for a different protein. And those two proteins are expressed only in the, in the back of the eye, in the structure we call the retina. And their job, the job of this protein, is to allow for uh, light to be captured for the process of phototransduction, the conversion of light energy to electricity to occur, so you and I can see, or an organism can see what's out there in the world. Now, 
As a result of the duplication of this gene and that slight change, all of a sudden this, this new creature that has these two genes has two ways of capturing light. Capturing light at two different wavelengths or two different intensities and so on. And it starts seeing or, or it starts being able to tell some of the wavelengths or some of the colors apart from each other. And again, all of a sudden, it has an adaptive advantage over its, its uh, other conspecifics in terms of uh, you know, capturing information from the world to which these other creatures are completely blind. It's like looking at a, at a, at a, a grayscale photograph and a color photograph of the same exact part of the world or a scene or you know, some, some part of, the, of, of, of nature. So th these gene-based uh, uh, processes, again, are the result of natural selection the way I explained it earlier, so I'm not going to uh, go back to it unless you ask me to. Or it could be developmental selection, that nothing genetic has happened, but through the process of interacting with the environment, some capacity has 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 uh, has appeared in the individual that doesn't exist in other members of that species. So, if changes happen within the lifetime of the individual, we call it developmental selection. Uh, again, these are changes that uh, make that individual, if you will, a better survivor, a, a fitter individual compared to its uh, conspecifics. And if it has a genetic basis, if the individual inherited it from uh, its parents, then it's natural selection. So that that's not the point. Whether it crosses to 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 the next um, generation or not. But there are mechanisms that allow for this to happen, and the, the old sort of Lamarckian theories are get, again gaining <laughs> some traction, not in the sense that he described them, but in the sense that we find evidence that things that we do end up changing our genome to the extent that if those changes happen at the gamete level, they could be passed on to our offspring without we having had, uh, inherited them ourselves. A, a great example of it is uh, exposure to toxins and alcohol as a, as, as a very specific example of that. So uh, this could alter one's genome to, to a point where uh, information that didn't exist in the genome before this person was born can then now be integrated and be passed on to the next generation. No, no that's not anything cognitive, but and, and we're not really, really focusing on whether cognitive uh, processes can be passed on or not. But it's a source, this could be a source of, within the person's lifetime, a source of change that confers um, an advantage. What I don't agree is that we are the best creature on this planet. Okay. So that, if that, if if that is the premise of of the argument, mm -hmm. and that is something that's not scientifically supported mm -hmm. and has absolutely no no no, uh, um, at least in my mind, it has no standing. Mm -hmm. Then I can't go any further. Mm -hmm. What we can say is that the humans are the best creature that have that have evolved for their conditions. The same way bats are the best creatures for the conditions they have evolved. Right? You and I cannot do anything in an environment that bats thrive. In the absence of light, they move around, they hunt, they, they procreate. So whose auditory system is better? Depends on where we are. Or whose um, movement patterns are better, or whose uh, cognitive capacities are better. So, but we'll get to, we'll get to some, uh, again, this is a way of really just uh, 
giving some food for thought for those who are interested, so that we could slowly make our way to see what, what makes us different. Mm -hmm. There are some things that make us different. Mm -hmm. I don't argue that, uh, mm -hmm. or argue against that at all. But at the same time, I, I cannot stand here and tell you that I believe that we are mm -hmm. the best, uh, that the ultimate, sort of the pinnacle <coughs> of evolution. No, I mean that uh, about this many, many, many things. Uh, the amount of information that we can extract from the same things, although uh, the range of the, um, you know, or uh, the input that can be processed is very limited, but uh, the amount of information that we can extract is much better than some uh, other uh, species. And we will get exactly, we'll get to that point, okay. and that could be that's the punchline, I think, <laughs> which I'm slowly working to get. Okay, sure. <laughs> so no, I don't. I don't argue against, you know, there being something special about us. Mm -hmm. Why else would we be mm -hmm. the dominant species on this planet? So something has happened to our minds that has not happened to these other creatures. But at the same time, we can't say that we are s completely set apart. That that there is there is a whole lot that we owe to our evolutionary history, mm -hmm. including some things that we consider purely and uniquely human, such as our ability to speak and to solve problems or to recognize ourselves or to have self-awareness, these types of things. Uh, I'm not sure how much important this part will be in understanding the rest of your talk, but I have a little problem uh, distinguishing between the natural selection and the natural selection in terms of what she said at first was that the uh, developmental selection is uh, something that ha uh, doesn't happen in the blueprint. We, we, at this point, we can consider that it has nothing to do with the blueprint itself. That it, it's something that happens only during the lifetime of the individual. So basically, when we're talking about evolution, uh, we're talking about like, all those traits that they pass exactly. in generations. Exactly. So if something doesn't happen in the blueprint, how that can pass to the next generation? So it may not be that it, it that that trait itself is passed on to the next generation, but because this person has acquired some cognitive capacities through one, throughout one's life, he might stand or she might stand a better chance of surviving. Maybe if you if you just come up with an example. Of I will I will get to it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I was just question about this. So this net, uh, is it somehow refers to the first one to Darwinian one and the, the second one to Lamarckian evolution? Uh, or no, I don't want to because I think that, that Lamarck distinction. because you have, yeah. to, you have just talked about Lamarck. I'm not sure if it's the same. Or no, well, what the, the what he claimed was that stuff that happens throughout our life could somehow be passed down. What what was the um, Common example was the, that of the giraffe. The giraffe, right? exactly. Right. So it's a, you know, but he thinks that it will be. But that was mainly, well, well, at least from his perspective, purely in the domain of anatomy and physiology. All I'm saying is that, for example, if you learn a particular skill that your your other conspecifics, other humans, can't do, yeah, or, that, right? right? <coughs> Although you may not be able to pass it on as a trait to the next generation, yeah, sure, sure, but it, it gives you a better chance of surviving. Multiply your, to, your exactly. Yeah. So that's the idea. Yeah. That, that, that is still cognitive evolution in your lifetime compared to uh, someone who <coughs> hasn't uh, retained or acquired that trait. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Just, just no, no, it's okay. So basically when you're talking about developmental selection, it's not selection in favor or against that trait itself. No, it's, it's selection. It's something that actually uh, gives you the power of just surviving exactly. so you can pass exactly. on the other traits that you have in exactly. your genome. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, the, the <coughs> uh, in brackets, as I, as I said earlier, there is the idea that some things can, in fact, make their way to the genome. No, but, but that, yeah. like that, that affects yeah. the genome and that's how it yeah. passes on. Exactly. So, uh, just to expand on these two levels, then, uh, these forces can either act on the mechanism itself, the module, let's say, you know, uh, take the example of, of color processing. Some, something happens at the genetic level, and now your color processing is better than others. Or it could happen, uh, sorry, uh, 
something happens to the, the process itself, so the process is improved. Now, you have to make a distinction between the process, the mental process, uh, as opposed to the input. Uh, so something uh, allows your brain to form better networks or uh, larger networks or, or something of that sort. And that results in, in better processing of, well, again, I put better in brackets, more efficient processing of information and so on. And that is a change that happens at the process level, at the, at the mechanism level. Or it happens to the cognitive, uh, to, the, uh, to the input to that cognitive mechanism. So if you have a module in your mind that deals with uh, visual processing, and all that's happened is that your eyes are better at capturing light, not the brain itself or the process itself. Uh, still, there is an advantage that is conferred upon, but it's at a different level. Uh, at the at the input level. Now, the the perhaps the best way. Oh, sorry, um, uh, I'll get to, to an example because uh, there's a very good example that at least in my mind helps to uh, tease these things apart. So, as a result of this uh, route is phylogenetic. If the source is natural selection, and now we start seeing why these terms are being used here. So, it's phylogenetic. Um, for anything that has a natural um, or heritable source, and ontogenetic if it has a uh, if the source or when the source is developmentally oriented, and the route is called construction when the locus is cognitive mechanism and inflection when this, the locus is input. So all I'm doing by, uh, up to this point is really just giving you an overview of her theory. Now I. In most parts, I agree with a lot of the stuff here, but I don't want to get into the arguments of where I think this is not right and, and why that is the case. Uh, I do have a good paper I can refer to you, or refer you to, if you want to read more about some of the criticisms of this. But this is what I wanted to get to as, as quickly as possible, which is a, a physiolo physiological analogy so that we can sort of uh, get a handle on all of this terminology, and then we can hopefully move on. So uh, take the stomach as, as, a, as, um, as, a, as a, the thing that is going to undergo um, some change, some evolutionary change. What is the job of the stomach? In, there is food that is inputted into it. It breaks it down, and energy comes out the other end, and that energy is what we use to move around and to survive and to have, to have offspring and so on and so on. That's the PG-13 version. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the amount of energy that can be produced by the stomach can increase due to the better activity of the enzymes that are working there. So they can break down food faster or to a smaller unit that release more energy, um, which would be uh, a construction because it's happening at the process level. Or alterations can happen in the type or quantity of food that is ingested. So maybe you eat, I don't know, uh, carbs instead of proteins. and. Uh, you end up having more energy if you input carbs into the stomach as opposed to proteins. More readily available uh, um, uh, energy, right? So this is how you can uh, distinguish between um, construction as opposed to inflection. Now, the change is phylogenetic construction if people with new enzymes stand a better chance of passing down the genetic code to their offspring. Because they eat better, they or they what they eat translates to more energy, they have more energy to move around and to find a mate and so on and so forth. The change is ontogenetic construction if the change from the old to the new system occurred within the individual's lifetime. Now what you eat might affect the way you express those genes. Some, some of the sort of better enzymes may uh, be more replicated, more produced as a result of what you eat, but it's all confined within your lifetime. Once you pass away, that is uh, the, this new trait that you acquired through your lifetime 
stays with your body. So if other genetic changes uh, to the input, for example, uh, let's say your jaw gets bigger or stronger, you have better teeth or more teeth as a result of, uh, of, of uh, genetic changes that happen in your ancestry. Uh, they bring about changes in the quantity or type of food that is ingested. It is called phylogenetic inflection, right? So it happens at the input level, not at the process level, but it's still the result of genetic changes. And lastly, uh, I promise this, <laughs> this is the last bit of detail. Uh, the change in the type and or quantity of ingested material occurred within the lifetime of the individual and as a consequence of the material ingested. Then it's called ontogenetic inflection. So an example would be consumption of the uh, original set of food, making you grow a little faster than your, your uh, age mates or your conspecifics so you can then travel further and find new food that, that then changes your uh, changes the, the, the way your stomach functions or the amount of energy you produce. Okay? So the these are the four possible ways that again these changes can happen and, and uh, some of them lead to inheriting sorry, passing down those genes to the next uh, generation and some of them stay with you. So how does all of this uh, um, relate to what we're talking about? Cognitive uh, processes. Again, uh, uh, if we just uh, work back from that analogy, we can say that the source of an adaptive feature of a cognitive process is phylogenetic if that feature was specifically favored by natural selection. And the source, uh, and I have a couple of examples to show you in a little bit. And the source of an adaptive feature of a cognitive process is ontogenetic if that feature was not specifically favored by natural selection, but is instead generated in the course of development. That'd be other. All right, so it, the emphasis of ontogenesis, ontogenesis is the interactions between the, uh, the, the mind and its input or its environment. And there's ample support for uh, this phenomenon we refer to as experience-dependent plasticity. Changes that happen to the actual subst substance of the brain as a result of the kinds of things we do. A um, good example of it is when you uh, look at the representation of, uh, of one's hands on the somatosensory cortex. If you take an average individual, uh, and map out the areas responsible or responsive to the to the two hands. And you take a, an expert musician, a violinist, or you know, particularly a violinist, uh, who uses one hand more than the other. A lot more dexterity is involved in one hand than the other. And you map the areas of the brain respon responsive to the two hands of the, the musician, you see that the area that's <coughs> corresponding to the left hand, if the individual is right-handed, <coughs> is much greater than the, the typical area of the left hand of an average person. So that means that the brain of that individual has undergone some change, not because of some adaptive uh, uh, trait that they have inherited, but because of what they've done in, in the world, what, what, how they've acted upon the world, and what kinds of skills that they have, they have uh, acquired. So these are the kinds of things uh, that allow us to make these distinctions. So coming back to here, then we're really uh, going to, um, uh, I want to draw your attention mainly to these two cells, which uh, are the focus of the kinds of things that the documentary is going to show us. The, the kinds of changes that have obviously been inherited from, from our common ancestors throughout the evolutionary history. Uh, one of which is uh, the case of, which I, which I promised I uh, would show an example of, the case of color perception. Here's uh, what our ancestors, how our ancestors used to see the, this part of the world without color vision, and that same part of the world with color vision. So if you're seeking for fruits to feed yourself, what is better to have, obviously, <laughs> a color photograph, no. color vision. 
to, you know, to, <laughs> to be able to see very readily where those uh, where those things are. So uh, again, a little bit more emphasis on uh, inflection versus uh, construction, and then uh, we, we move on to the good stuff. So cases are identified as inflectional if there is no compelling evidence that the target cognitive mechanism is qualitatively distinct, but there is evidence that uh, the input to the cognitive mechanism is being biased in favor of a particular environmental domain. So what you just saw is an example of inflectional uh, 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 change in the sense that the input to the system has changed, but you have no compelling evidence saying that this, this creature's mind is operating any better than that creature's mind. It's just that the input to the mind has, has changed as a result of changes, uh, genetic changes to the, to the eyes. <coughs> Cases of adaptive uh, specialization of cognitive processes are classed as constructive when there is evidence that cognitive mechanism in question, or the cognitive mechanism in question, is qualitatively different from those that uh, process different information in the same species or the same information in different species. So uh, an example of that is the way we process faces uh, compared to our uh, primate relatives. Uh, monkeys, just like us, can recognize individuals, uh, individual uh, individuals within their species or outside their species based on facial information. So you show a monkey two human faces, they can, they can tell uh, or indicate which one they've seen before. If, if one is familiar to them, one is not. Um, you show an ape the same thing, they can tell the difference between a familiar face and a non-familiar face. But the way we end up processing that information is fundamentally different. Uh, and that is uh, manifested through uh, a couple of examples I have to show you. So, uh, tell me as quickly as you can who this is. Okay, so if I re measured your reaction time, you, you would be probably twice uh, uh, slower identifying her this way as opposed to this way. Right? This is a very famous phenomenon known as phase inversion effect. And uh, it's, it, it shows that we as, as humans have, in a nutshell, have a preferred way of encoding phases by incorporating the relationship between the features, what we call in the, in the field as holistic processing. When you start distorting the relationship of those features, then uh, you have to resort to other processes that take longer and so on and so forth. So the process is not as automatic as before for the processing of the exact same information set as you had uh, seen previously. So there is no change in the amount and the nature of information between these two, except that the arrangement of parts is what has, what has undergone change. Or the same phenomenon could be, uh, could be manifested in this, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I mean, he's hard to not recognize, but again, uh, if we were to quantify this, now that we're talking about apes and everything, <laughs> uh, uh, you, would, you would recognize this face faster than the same face when it's contrast reversed. So the reason I show you these things, uh, aside from a little joke on our dear president, uh, is uh, to, to illustrate that monkeys have no problem telling, telling you who this is as fast as they can tell you who that is. There's no change in their reaction time. So there, there's something that at a process level they're doing differently from us. And that's the mechanistic, um, uh, if you will, or the, uh, the, the uh, constructive um, uh, process that we're talking about. Um, that's something that's happening at the mechanistic level that sets these two apart. They're seeing that the, the, their eyesight is just as good as ours. They see millions of colors just like we do. In fact, our, our 
uh, color processing and visual acuity and so, so on and so forth is almost identical to them. So there's no input difference. There's something happening at the process level that uh, allows for these uh, changes to manifest themselves. In both cases, even the second one? Yeah, even the second one. And even face parts. So you show them the face parts, they can still identify that as being some someone they've seen before. And, uh, or features of a face they've seen before. Even if you randomly change all now the that faces? Be, that I haven't... I don't know about that. But apes don't uh, fail at that test the same way we fail at it. Or, or, or not that we fail, but we were much slower at telling who, who, who those people were in the contrast reverse and in the inverted versions compared to the upright normal presentation. So apes are like us, so we can conclude that at the, even at the process level, there is something similar. And that is really what we're after. If the process is the same between the two of us, there's a very good chance that we've inherited that process from, from a common ancestor. That something happened between, uh, or during the evolution of primates between monkeys and apes that brought that change into the picture and then it got stuck because for whatever reason it was selected for. So, uh, what, you're gonna, what you're about to see is far simpler <laughs> than anything I've talked to you about uh, up to now. And, and the reason, again, the reason I, I presented a bit of uh, technical stuff is I, I, I know uh, you guys are very inquisitive and curious uh, people and you'd like to have some substance behind what you see. The documentary itself is quite, uh, in my opinion, it's quite watered down, but it still has very important content. And what it focuses on is primarily this kind of cognitive, uh, this route of cognitive evolution. Those changes that have come about as a result of natural selection that have impacted cognitive processes at the process level, not at the input level, and not uh, for uh, things that happen throughout one's lifetime, right? So again, the purpose of all of this, if you will, nonsense was to <laughs> uh, give a label to the kinds of things that we're going to be looking at. So the next two parts of the talk are, are going to be covered uh, essentially in the first two sections of the documentary that I'll show you. So first, it'll give you um, uh, an overview of where we fit in the context of um, evolution, what are our common or our nearest uh, relatives, if you will, and uh, some examples how, on how we systematically study these capacities uh, to reach those conclusions uh, about what is uniquely human and what is not what is what is shared. So, without further ado, let me just uh, 